My name is Conley Rogers. I'm a technical account manager at GitLab. Um, previously, I, I worked for some time at Verizon, which is uh, probably the largest telecommunications company in the uh, US. And there I led a, a team of engineers that focused on things from DevOps to cultural in initiatives like an inner source program uh, that we kicked off. And it took, it took really years to kind of gain momentum and steam. So I wanted to, to share that story with y'all. Um, before we, we do, I'm also joined by uh, one of my former colleagues, uh, Vishal Kulshrestha. Vishal, you want to say a little two things about you? Sure thing. Hey guys, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay, hey. So yeah, so as Colin said, I've been working at Verizon for a while now. I've gone through a few loops of development and infrastructure operations. And the latest and the most interesting part has been the DevOps. And uh, one of the projects which we had in the last couple of years was uh, related to inner sourcing. Of course, uh, there's more black and white in that, but it does touch a lot of uh, lot of our infrastructure, a lot of our tools and a lot of our products. So I've got the opportunity now to share what uh, we have experienced with in Verizon, what we have learned, and uh, of course, what the benefits have been. So I would like to you know share uh, what uh, I have learned with the community here, and hopefully I will get to learn and get some benefits from that. So thanks, Conley, for uh, giving me a chance over here. Yeah, thanks for joining me. Um, I, one other thing I was going to say before we really get rolling, I my slides are all like GitLab -y and stuff, but really this has nothing to do with GitLab. So I just it was convenient for me to use this template, and I already had some of the slides. So this is not by any means a, a pitch or anything for that product. So wanted to disclaim that. Now, um, this story, it, it aligns very well with the theme of security um, and sort of the, the risk versus reward of an inner source program and, and having code that's easily discovered. Um, it started for, for Verizon around 2017. Um, we I gave a talk at one of our internal tech conferences about um, innovation time and the ability to kind of work on this 10%, 20%, however much our, our leadership was willing to give us. But I, I floated the idea of what we, we could do collaboratively to, to with you know, a few extra hours a week to work on what we wanted to. And this started to spark an interest. Um, we saw other companies do it with success. Notoriously, Google had some innovation time where every week they had, you know, 20% of their schedule to work on something totally outside their their day to day job. We wanted that because we were facing a ton of stiff competition with telecoms and to differentiate and to bring sort of 5G, which was barely being talked about at the time, but to bring that idea to market, we knew it had to be different than 4G. We needed to be more part of the ecosystem and the applications, not just the infrastructure below it. And so that was a huge focus for IT, was how can we reintroduce ideas and, and generate uh, ideas from everywhere and everyone across the company. Uh, so we did introduce this. It was two hours on Thursday, two hours on Tuesday. That's how it started. Um, and then we also had to kind of reevaluate uh, our, our tool set. You know, did we have the right tools once we had this cultural change and once we had the permission and, and buy-in to, to work on other things outside of our purview, how do we discover projects? How do we publish projects that anyone could see and contribute to? So that was really the, the tool conversation, although it wasn't the most important. It was key that we, we chose a more collaborative platform in GitLab um, than uh, Bitbucket. We were considering GitHub as well. It, I think it really came down to costs, but um, that was, that was an important step because then we, we had a lot more at our fingertips when it came to like surfacing and sharing and, and collaborating through merge requests and stuff and pull requests. In 2019, um, we, we did formalize an inner source program office um, with the help of an acquisition we made with uh, Yahoo AOL, if you recall at the time. They... We wanted to incorporate some of their engineering capabilities, right? Like they, they internet company, born and raised, uh, doing 
uh, high delivery uh, throughput, as well as handling a lot of customer interactions. Um, and so we knew there was a lot to learn from this. And so we wanted to seed their ideas, what worked for them, as well as some like very Verizon specific projects to get the ball rolling with Intersource, to give like a working model of, of something that looks good and that we think centrally could achieve uh, a lot of reuse opportunity. So we had five different projects. Um, one was like an infrastructure as code project. We had a documentation as code so that you didn't have to, to write all this custom code just to get an internal doc site up. Um, and then came the real hard part and why this talk was uh, important to, to share here, which is that we had some outdated sort of arbitrary guidelines with source code that was saying that all source code is least privileged and that you needed to only give explicit access never in the, in the language at the time, it was never gonna be possible for us to surface and just have it discover uh, code in a natural way. And so we had to kind of start negotiating and bringing in security, legal um, and risk to the table. And that's when we kind of formulated a solution where if you got some attestation from the project owner, as well as a CI scan that looked for secrets, passwords, tokens, this sort of thing, that would enable us to get to this vision of shareable, discoverable uh, projects and eventually proper inner source. Um, and so that really took place over the course of a couple of years. But by the time I started to wrap up in 2021, we had 48 inner source projects from the five that we seeded. Um, and we were then working towards like a, a discovery marketplace, which is a pattern um, that is listed in the inner source commons. So we started to go down that route. I wanted to speak more to the security and legal aspect because we did have quite a, a few forces working against us um, that made this a longer process. Um, for one, that, that the data classification hadn't been reevaluated since the mid aughts. So we knew, and myself as an individual contributor, program manager of this, this program, I would advise if this is you, if this is similar to your company, to go deep on this data classification document. Ours was like 70 something pages. It had versions dating years and years back. I just looked at the most recent one and I really familiarized. I, I read it top to bottom. I was looking specifically for source code and uh, keywords like that. And because I myself was educated on what the, the ins and outs were, I could also find opportunity for loopholes or rewording to make it uh, so that it wasn't so hard and fast. So that's one piece of advice, um, if this is you. The other was we really didn't have a lot of communication happening across business units because um, I was in sort of our internal IT platform DevOps tooling space. And so uh, having representation, one or two people from each business unit was really important for me to understand um, different challenges there. So inviting people into your inner source calls, having weekly or bi-weekly cadences can, can achieve this. And then how do we show the ROI? I was very fortunate to have uh, some important um, smart technologists that, that were communicating up to our VPs. Um, from the Yahoo side, it was Gil Yehuda and Ashley Wolf who were very integral in this. They had a ton of experience with open source. And so they were able to articulate that value of, you know, more eyes is actually healthier for your code, assuming it's not like a secret sauce type project. And so showing some ROI and time savings, I knew was going to be key for us because that was being asked. I, I talked about the good stuff that was happening with Verizon Media, um, uh, Yahoo at the time, and that we also had a technically savvy legal counsel that was programmer by day or, or by night. He was a legal counsel by day. So he understood it and wanted to, to see this happen. Um, and then security. So we had a, a meeting every Wednesday where we would show small incremental progress. And that took two years in totality from when we started creating that, that secret scanning and process to when we had it working in production, approved language and, and all kinds of stuff. And we were able to then go broad and communicate it to, to Verizon developers. 
Um, another thing I don't take for granted, but I had, you know, in my back pocket was this lead developer with experience in open source. And so um, Greg Swindle was fantastic mentor for me, but he also was super savvy and he was able to write the code that we needed um, to make this vision a reality. So all of those together is what helped us get over that hurdle of a lot of pushback from security and risk. And I wanted to throw it over to Vishal just to get like a state of affair, how things are going. Um, so Vishal, whenever you're ready. Sure, hey, thanks Conley and thanks folks. I just, uh, you know, Conley has covered most of what uh, we've, uh, our runway, which has been in the rise and at inner source, you know, obviously, uh, open source has been a big wheel there, and you know we are trying to follow the same uh, guardrails for inner source. So it's uh, it's helpful, it's fun, and uh, like Conley mentioned, a couple of years back we were uh, you know still finding our way around the basic roadmap, and thanks to the contribution from experts, uh, from uh, we are able to benefit. We are seeing some benefits now within Verizon. I just want to focus on. I don't want to go too much into detail, but you're free to ask me questions, folks, if you have any. But uh, what I would like to say is we have identified projects, we have identified the tools which will we will be touching as a part of our inner source journey. And uh, we obviously the next step would be to quantify and to look at the benefits and the returns we are seeing. That is the best way to onboard the community, onboard the management, and of course, the, make a roadmap for the future. So yes, uh, there have been a quite a few projects out there which have been uh, subject to inner source and which have been, which have acknowledged the benefits. I just want to focus on a couple of them now, which are still active, which are still uh, live before me as I work today. Uh, obviously, there are a whole bunch of other projects which not everybody is onboarded on. So uh, we have a very basic uh, DevOps tool, which are the basis for any kind of IT infrastructure which we are supporting today. So we are using uh, Jenkins jobs, uh, which are able to take care of uh, our requirements which are there in terms of assessing the current potential for inner source, taking action to get projects onboarded and tag within a source and be able to look at what are the benefits we are achieving for that. So I would like to look at, uh, focus on one particular project. The first one in the bubble there is the VB React. So the way we have been trying to uh, gauge the benefits so far have been uh, pretty uh, well acknowledged and the numbers are pretty lucrative, so to say. Lucrative, I would say, to the point where making a business case or a presentation to future management becomes very easy. Making a case and presenting it to potential project owners, developers, it becomes very easy when we have lucrative numbers like this. But again, uh, one thing I would like to insist on is uh, the commitment has to persist from the management, from the development community. We have incidents where we have mentors like Conley who are actually uh, initiating this and kicking it off, but now missing uh, experts like that does cause a little bit of uphill tax, but it's still, it's a pretty solid business case has been made and established. So we are able to progress, but I would clearly want to insist that we do need a backup and a commitment from the management and we need the uh, ID community onboarded. So I can uh, go into details of what we have been doing, how we've been using, uh, for example, Jenkins tools, which are- Yeah, I think uh, that's, Vishal, that's interrupt you, man. I, I think that's actually, um, it's it speaks for itself there. Like the Jenkins job was really just how we, we ensure people scanned the secrets on those projects. Um, right. And we can come back to this, we we're short on time, but we can come back to this in the Q&A. Um, in terms of like how we measure success, it's not perfect. You can see forks commits. Um, and then we are, we talk to the project owner to assess about how much time did it, you invest in this project. And we can say, okay, roughly 80 hours or two weeks worth of time on Docs' code. 
and it's been forked eight times, eight teams used it. So they're saving that amount of hours, sort of rudimentary. Um, and I think there's even better ways of going about this, but thank you, Vishal, for that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap us up on this last slide real quick. Okay, sure, thank you, Colleen. Yeah, yeah, thanks. The only other things I wanted to mention, and we've got one more great topic is there is a pattern out there. I saw a question, I think from Rev in the chat, like what should you be looking for uh, risk-wise to mitigate risk for, for sharing projects? There's an awesome uh, merge request that was just merged in a pattern called balancing openness and security. Highly recommend y'all check that out. It really lays out soup to nuts. You know, how do you, you handle user access as well as the settings on that project, like protecting default branches and um, putting in uh, merge requests as required or pull requests. And the only other thing I wanted to mention, because this is this would basically alleviate that whole Jenkins job and custom work that we did at Verizon. If we knew about this or if it was out there at the time, it's a compliance framework. If you're using GitLab, you can leverage this. There's also, I found some open source options in GitHub, one called Comply. So anyways, I'll put these in the chat. And without the without further ado, I'll hand it back. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Elspeth Minty. Uh, I'm the global lead of the Java platform engineering team at Morgan Stanley. Um, I guess the reason I'm here is, is because um, a large amount of our code, uh, we in the source, uh, it's been a pattern that we have used internally within the firm for a number of years very successfully. Um, I'm also the co-lead of the inner source special interest group at Finos, the, the FinTech Open Source Foundation. Um, so I'm going to be talking uh, about uh, how we think about inner source and, and security uh, and basically trying to make the case that the um, the types of things that we see uh, as development processes in in a source projects are exactly the, the types of things that we want that support security in in, in a source projects. Uh, it, it, well, in any project, um, and basically that we should be um, looking at in a source as, as really setting the right guidelines for for what we we want for um, for secure development processes. Um, so I'm going to start by doing something that I always tell people who are doing this kind of talk to never do, which is to say what I'm not going to be talking about. Um, I'm not a security expert. I'm a library developer. Um, I'm not going to be talking in any kind of detail uh, about particular um, processes, uh, and I'm not going. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about secure code. Uh, processes. This, this talk's really focusing on development practices. Um, so I wanted to start off just by um, talking a little bit about why I think inner source is, is so important for modern software development. Um, the thing for me about inner source, it's not the code, it's not the pull request, it's the culture that it fosters within an organization. Um, you know, the, it, by its nature, in a, in a source um, gets people talking. It creates collaboration between different teams. It encourages people to share ideas and it builds a network. Um, and that is, that's hugely valuable. Um, getting your customers involved in your code um, changes how people think about the code. Um, it's not, for me, it's not um, any longer my team's Java libraries, it's Morgan Stanley Java libraries. Uh, and that sense of ownership, um, I think, is a really big deal for, for developers and, and the mindset of how you think about what you're doing. Um, I also consume inner source uh, in the projects that, that I work on, um, and it gives me a lot of control over um, the, you know, the, the, timing um you know it brings it back back into my control if i'm relying on functionality that needs to be added into another library um a lot of those other teams have their own priorities uh, and their own set of uh, work that they need to get done and they can't always for very good reasons they can't always accommodate um, what i'm looking to do um, but inner source gives me a way to kind of bring that bring this back in and, and control 
what I'm doing. Uh, and I think it's also a great way for junior developers um, to widen their experience, to see outside their immediate team what other people think and how they approach problems, uh, and just to get more experience in, in, in development. Um, so what do when I talk about good development practices for security, what do I actually mean by that? Um, I think there's three uh, important points to this. The first is process. Um, if you, you wherever you're talking uh, about security, you need to have a good understanding of, of what the process is that you are putting in place to control things. Um, and for development, this is everything from um, how you think about requirements, um, how you write the code, what standards do you use within the code, what kind of tooling do you use to support secure coding, um, reviews of the code, the CI, CD, how you manage change into the environment, how you um, deploy code. These, these are all things that there has to be a very solid process around. Um, and hand in hand in with that is automation. Um, these, having this process in place is, is important. Um, and the more you can automate it, um, the better. Uh, if you have manual processes, there is much more room for error and for exploit. So automating as much as possible is, is very important. The key to this for me is reliable and repeatable automated changes. Um, and that's talking about um, automated testing. It's also talking about code quality um, and security scanning tools to make sure that what is, what is going on is, um, it is very well understood. It's meeting uh, quality controls uh, and you, you know exactly what has happened, when it happens, who signed off on it, um, and the whole story. Um, the third one is openness, and this always kind of seems like an odd one when you're um, you're talking about security. But I think the, the point was made earlier as well. The more eyes you have on something, the better. Um, it's really important to have a kind of upfront discussion about why are you doing something, um, you know, what's what's the um, what's the reasoning behind it? Why does it look this way? Are there any other um, ways you could approach it? And that kind of just you know, thinking things through, talking things over, looking at things from different angles um, is is very important to to making sure. That the the code that is coming out is high quality and 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 uh, and meets the 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 requirements. So how does this map to inner source? Um, I think it's pretty much exactly the same story for inner source. Um, process is really important in inner source, and this was something that when um, I started in sourcing projects, I don't think I really understood just how important it was. Um, but if you, know, if you get halfway through doing an inner source contribution and someone turns around and say, oh, you forgot to do this thing that we never told you about, that's really irritating. Um, so you're being upfront on what the expectations are when you contribute code, um, how you expect it to look, what standards people need to meet, uh, knowing that going in is, is really important. Um, and similarly, automation. Uh, a lot of the code um, that is in a source, particularly um, for me, most of the, the code that I in a source is, is large library projects. It's not realistic for someone to come into that and to understand everything about the whole thing. Um, you know, when people make a contribution, they contribute it with the test to make sure that that contribution is okay. Um, but they also need to have, need to um, be comfortable that that contribution isn't causing any knock-on changes anywhere else in the code. Uh, and the way that you have to do that is, is through automated testing and through having um, good co coverage of functionality and high quality tests. You need to be able to rely on the test to tell you whether or not the thing is, the, the change is good. Um, openness, I think is also very important um, in, in, in the source. Um, there is nothing more depressing 
rather than seeing a pull request come out of the blue uh, where it, you look at it and it's clear that someone has spent a large amount of time thinking about how to do this and implementing it and you look at it and you realize that you're not going to take it uh, and you know there could be a whole host of reasons about that it may just not be the direction that you want to go with with the project um, and saying no, no to these is is really unpleasant for for everyone involved so having the discussion up front talking about you know this is what i want to do um you know are you okay with this does it fit with um you know what we're trying to do with the projects um how are you thinking about implementing it um you know and getting a good sense of what's going on so that when the pull request turns up you, it, it actually makes sense um and con contributions um are a great way to share culture uh, across the organization in both directions. You know, we learn from the people that we take contributions from and they, I hope, learn from, from the, uh, the feedback that we, we give them. Um, so for me, um, just to, to summarize, I think that inner source practices uh, are really important for promoting good security. Even if you're not in a position where you can in a source of project, taking taking the approach that in the source promotes and and thinking about the projects as in the source, um, it it really reflects a lot of good security practices. The core to it is really that it's it's good engineering practices. Um, you know, having automation, um, having a simple um, build process that that anyone could just pick up and clone the code and and run it. Um, thinking about what your own practices are, making sure that you're clear on how you think about the code and how you want to manage it, uh, and getting people involved in, in communications and you're know, giving people a safe environment where they can share ideas, you can come up with things, you can brainstorm stuff. Um, it makes it, you know, it, even if you're not in the position to take contributions, having that approach to how you manage code, I think is, is a very valuable way of thinking about it. 